Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today. Performance tuning, big, big topic. We actually uh, asked the tech ed organizers to give us just the full week to talk to you. But then they said, no, let's give you a 75 minute session. So we have precious little time to cover a huge topic area. So what we're going to do is focus in and talk to you about the key component of performance tuning. And that's actually finding the problem. Once you've found the problem, the job is actually pretty easy. So I'm Adam Mechanic. I specialize in uh, financial services databases based in Boston. I've uh, written a couple books. I have a blog at sqlblog.com. And I speak a lot of these things as my sixth year at TechEd. I'm really glad to be back. This is definitely one of my favorite conferences to speak at all year. Really look forward to it. I'd like you to note two things on the slide. One is my email address at the bottom of the screen. Feel free to drop me a line, questions, comments, if you're lonely, whatever. Uh, the other thing I'd like to point out is sqlblog.com. Again, that's my blog site. And that is one of the places that you can go after this session to download the scripts. So you might want to do that. My name is Mike Wackel. I am a senior program manager at Microsoft. It says here I work in the SQL Server Diagnostic Infrastructure. That's just a fancy way of saying that I work in the engine on stuff like SQL Trace, extended events, and the stuff that makes error messages pop up on your screen. All the infrastructure that helps you figure out there's a problem. Um, I speak occasionally. I've been to past. This is my first tech ad, so I'm very happy to be here, and I'm happy that you came to see us. And I also speak at ballroom dance competition, so you didn't read that wrong. I don't give this talk to the ballroom dancers, though. You can see my blog there up on MSDN. I do also mirror that blog over to sqlblog.com. Adam helped me set that up. So whichever one you like to read, you can read that. I'm perfectly fine with it. And you can see my email address there on the bottom of the screen. As Adam says, we're going to be talking about tuning with a specific focus on how to find the problems that might exist in your system. And we're going to start out with a bit of an overview. Every good presentation has to have a virtuous circle. Now, I don't know that performance problems can be considered virtuous, but that's what they call the circle, so we're going to talk about the virtuous circle. In fact, because systems are so dynamic, the fact is that if you get rid of one performance problem or behavior you don't like, your workload's going to change. You're going to get more data. You're going to get less data. Something's going to cause another performance issue. So the fact of dealing with performance problems is itself cyclical and doing it correct can indeed be virtuous. So the first kind of stage of the performance tuning cycle is uh, monitoring, and actually data collection. And if you're not collecting data, you do not know what to tune. And this is one of the biggest mistakes that people make. Uh, the server's slow, and they go in, and they start guessing about things. And they start uh, trying to add indexes or trying to kind of figure out which queries are slow on an ad hoc basis, uh, test something. Maybe they have a hunch. I don't like hunches. As a performance engineer, you don't want to rely on hunches. You want to rely on metrics, on data. And you want to collect your data in a timestamp format. And you want to be able to baseline the data so that you can ask questions like, at 10 AM on Wednesday, what kinds of activity can we expect to see on our server? And this will help you to understand, come 10 AM some day, when there's a big spike, it will help you understand whether that spike is normal or whether there's a problem that you actually need to look at. So whenever you're performance tuning, monitoring, and collection of the data is probably the most important thing you can do. It keeps you focused on the real problems and keeps you away from guessing and wasting time and looking at things that you don't really need to look at. So the next phase after monitoring is closely coupled, and that's actually troubleshooting. And this is actually looking at the data. So we kind of split this up into collection and then identification. This is the part that's a little bit more difficult and also a little bit more interesting. Uh, looking at the data and trying to interpret whether you have a problem is one issue. And then if you do have a problem, what that problem is. Is it a disk problem? Is it a memory problem, et cetera, et cetera. And at this point, what you want to do is start exercising that cycle. If you're not collecting enough data or detailed enough data to identify the actual problem, you obviously need to drill in and collect a more granular form of data. So 
cyclically monitoring, troubleshooting, monitoring, troubleshooting, and then moving on. So once you've found the problem, obviously that's the part where tuning and optimization comes into play. Most obvious thing you want to do is correct the problem. You've found what's going on. You don't have an index. You want to add the index. All that good stuff, correcting the problem. But there's a few other things you might do that don't necessarily say, oh, correct the problem and I'm done. One is improve the query. Maybe you could rewrite the query in a different fashion, reorder a few things. So you should really consider that. That might be a good solution. Another thing to do is just modify your approach. Maybe you're using tempdb and you could find another way to do that. Maybe you're using variables when you could be using a common table expression. So think about how your approach is actually impacting your performance, because there are certainly differences between how each of the components in SQL Server work. Different components work better for different things. And then finally, testing and deploying. Once you've made the fix, you got to get it out to the users so that they can experience it. First thing you want to do before you send it out there is validate it. This is really a critical part. You want to make sure that, first of all, the data you want to receive is still the same data you're getting after your fix. You want to make sure that the behavior you're trying to avoid is now actually being avoided, that you've corrected the problem that you found. This might also be a good time to add to your monitoring. If you change something about the way your queries work, you want to make sure you're monitoring that change so that you see that thing in your new monitoring solution. You might also need to take a new baseline. This is another good thing to do during test line to make sure that you have that accounted for in your baseline. Then you can move it to production, get it out there so the users are actually interacting with your new behavior. And then just to close that down, you want to confirm with the users who are using this product that the behavior is actually what they want, that they're not still seeing the slowdown, that they're not still seeing the bad behavior that caused this entire cycle to start in the first place. And then finally, and we can't f emphasize this enough, don't forget to test. If you don't test, bad things can happen. As Adam mentioned right at the beginning, optimization and tuning is a huge topic. And since we only have 75 minutes, we want to narrow into some very specific things, and that is how you find the problems that you need to tune and optimize. And we're going to focus even a bit more on some specific technologies that you can use to do that. Two key technologies, in fact. First, dynamic management views. This is a tool we introduced quite a while ago in SQL Server. It allows to you to get point-in-time information about cumulative data about the server. Most of them are about since the server has started. There's a whole raft of these that we'll talk about as we go into detail about dynamic management views. The thing you got to remember about this is since it's point-in-time, if you want to use it for historical analysis or comparisons, you have to take snapshots and store those as you're going along. So there's your monitoring solution. Second technology we're going to talk about is extended events. This is a diagnostic tracing facility. So instead of cumulative data like you see in DMVs, you're going to see actual point of activity data. Every time something happens, we're going to fire that event. It happens again, we're going to fire it again. So if you're storing that data off, it basically has a historical trend itself to the level that you're going to keep that data. Important things you want to know about extended events is that this is what we are going to be pushing to replace SQL Trace and Profiler starting in the next version of SQL Server, codenamed Denali. And if you've worked with extended events before, you notice there was a gap that it didn't have a user interface. We'll be talking about the user interface that we're adding in Denali so that we can help you along in undertaking this as your tracing facility. All right. So dynamic management views. Well, for those of you who came from SQL Server 7.0, SQL Server 2000, you probably remember these things called the system views. And these were kind of slightly terse ways of figuring out what was going on on the server at any given time. There were eight or 10 of them. I can't remember exactly how many. Not, not too many, just a handful. They didn't have too many columns. And you could take a peek and kind of start guessing about what was happening on the server, why the server was slow. Maybe you could figure it out, maybe not. Well, along the way, in SQL Server 2005, something called the dynamic management views shipped with the project. And now instead of uh, eight of these views, there are scores of them. And they throw out information about all sorts of different parts of the internal activity of SQL Server. In SQL Server 2008, uh, they were enhanced, and they'll be enhanced again in SQL Server Denali. And one of the enhancements in 2008 was they're no longer called dynamic management views. 
someone realized, well, there are some functions in there too. They're not all views. So now we're supposed to call them dynamic management objects. And I apologize, you'll hear me slipping back and forth because even three years in on SQL Server 2008, I'm still not used to not calling them views. So I apologize for that. Uh, the important thing is these are very regularly updated and enhanced. You definitely need to keep track uh, since even in service packs and hotfixes, there are columns added to these things all the time and there are additional views added on a regular basis. Uh, something I want to point out is that these things are basically a picture of an internal memory structure uh, that's running behind the scenes in the query processor or the storage engine or some other area of SQL Server. And they are built to err on the side of concurrency rather than consistency. And what this means, let me give you an example. On a busy server, there could be hundreds of thousands of locks taken and released every second. Now, if you do select star from sysdm tran locks, that's the dynamic management view that gives information about locks, well, you're going to start getting lock information streaming back to your management studio session. And how long is that going to take to stream back? Well, if there's millions of locks, it could take a minute or two, something like that, for all those rows to come in. Now, if SQL Server were to take a latch or a lock on that internal memory structure and make sure that nothing changed while you were selecting from it, then your entire server would grind to a halt while you were pulling that information back so that you could get consistency. So instead, no latches or locks are taken. The data comes back, but as it's coming back, the data can change. Data that you've already read can change. Data that you haven't read yet can change. So this means that sometimes, as you're querying these views, especially on an active server, uh, you can get kind of weird data. You can get keys that seem like they should be unique that will actually repeat. You can get kind of slightly half-formed data, data that do doesn't quite mesh up. And that's OK. Uh, the idea is to take snapshots and understand that it might be slightly inconsistent in some cases, but just want to keep that in mind to uh, make sure that you're not expecting you know, all of your keys to be unique and things like that. So why do you want to use these things? These give you raw access to a ton of information. If you can write queries, I hope that you all can write queries, since you're in a SQL Server session here at TechEd. Uh, if you can write queries, you can get a ton of information from the dynamic management views. The better your query skills are, the better the information is. Uh, there is a little bit of complexity with some of the views. It can take a while to get your queries quite right. And there's a ton of data, uh, but they're very, very fast, generally speaking. Again, they're views over internal memory structures. So generally, there's not a lot of disk access or anything going on. It's just a ton of CPU overhead. And uh, so you can pull the data out and get it into a raw data format. And as DBAs or database developers, we're all very, very familiar with sitting in Management Studio playing with data. So this is just kind of second nature. So here's the issue. There are a ton of these things. I could talk about them literally all week. And when you open up Management Studio and look at the list, it's overwhelming. You might not know where to look. And so what you need to do is narrow things down. So as a first pass, what I like to do is just look at them by category. Now, they're pretty well-named objects, sys, dm, os, something. And that something is the name of the category, generally. And if you look through these categories, uh, you'll see that there's a lot of special purpose DMVs, SQL CLR DMVs, cryptographic DMVs, query notifications DMVs. Uh, if you're not using one or more of these features that are special purpose, ignore them. You don't need them right now. If you need them later, you can start using them later. So by kind of taking this approach, we can quickly narrow things down. Today we're talking about performance tuning, and I'd like to talk in particular about real-time activity monitoring. So we'll narrow down to the categories that I feel are important for this role. And these are dynamic management views that deal with the execution environment, details about what query execution is up to, uh, information on transactions, information on the query processor itself, and then information on everyone's favorite shared bottleneck, TempDB. So let's start with the execution environment. Here's how it works, in brief. Uh, you want to do something on SQL Server. You want to run a query. So the first thing you have to do is establish a connection to the server. If you're not connected, can't do much. Once you're connected, you get something called a session. And on behalf of your session, you can begin submitting requests. Select, insert, update, batches with multiple selects, inserts, or updates, store procedures, whatever. Well, there are DMVs that align with all of this. So the top level DMV, sys dm exec sessions, tells you all the sessions that are currently attached 
to your server. Now, these sessions may or may not be doing anything. They might just be sitting there sleeping. Maybe someone uh, hooked up SSMS, connected, and went to lunch. Well, they have a session running. It's just not running any queries at the moment. But you'll see it in this view. Now, if you want to find out which sessions have active requests, you jump down to the sysdm exec request view. And this is going to have one row per session that has an active request, unless you're using a very esoteric feature named multiple active result sets, in which case there might be more than one row in this uh, view. But I've never met anyone who's using multiple active result sets, so except for this gentleman right here. So congratulations, number one. Uh, other than him, you all can have one row in that uh, second system exec request view. And here's the cool thing. The sessions DMV, uh, if you look at the CPU time, reads, logical reads, writes, et cetera, that shows you information that's cumulative to the lifetime of the session. So if your session uh, connected and started sending batch after batch after batch, uh, you can see in, that, in those columns in the, in the sessions DMV information about the entire lifetime, all those queries that ran. Whereas in the request DMV, you can see information about just the request that's currently running. So this is a really nice way to kind of separate things and see sessions that are doing a lot of activity with lots of short queries versus one query that's doing a ton of activity all on its own, that kind of thing. And when you're baselining, you want to generally baseline both of these views. You want to find out uh, how much activity your sessions are doing in general, how much activity your queries are doing. And then over time, if you see spikes, sessions that are doing a lot more activity than is expected, you can start digging in and looking to try to figure out why that's happening, what changed. So once we've taken a look at the execution environment itself, we can drill in further, get information on what the execution environment is up to. So we know that we have a session or a request, and we know that it's doing something, and we probably want to know at some point, what is that something? What is the query that's running that's taking forever to return? And maybe we want to know, why is that query slow? And where's the first place we look for that? Well, if you're me, I look at the query plan. So we can drill in. And we can do this using a couple of those functions, which necessitated this switch from DMV to DMO. So here's how that works. In the sysdm exec requests view, there are two columns, a SQL handle and a plan handle. And both of these are binary strings. And you can take these uh, values these binary strings, and you can pass them off to a couple of functions. The system exec SQL text function, which is shown here, or there's a system exec query plan function. And you pass in the handle, the, either the SQL handle or the plan handle, depending on whether you want text or plan. Uh, if you pass in the SQL handle, you get the text, as shown here. If you pass in a plan handle, you'll get an XML show plan instance. And it's really nice in Management Studio, starting in SQL Server 2008, that XML is clickable. So you'll get uh, XML back in your grid, you click on it, and a full graphical query plan will launch. And that's the query that's currently running. Uh, you won't get uh, the actual query plan information, like the number of rows affected or anything like that, since the query is still in flight. But you'll get a lot of information about what the query is up to, enough to debug in many cases. So from here, transactions. Now, everything in SQL Server, pretty much, is transactional, whether you tell it to be or not. We have implicit transactions started whenever we run a query, or uh, whenever we do an update, uh, or an insert, or anything else. Or we have explicit transactions that you can start using begin tran, commit, or maybe roll back, whatever. Uh, the important thing is that the transactions are, of course, associated with your session and with your request. And as you're running the transaction, especially as you're doing work, like inserts, updates, or deletes, that work gets logged in the transaction log in the database, naturally. So what we want to be able to do is find out, uh, for example, when the log is growing out of control or when we're having disk contention issues on the drive that the transaction log is on, perhaps it'd be nice, I think, to find out what's contributing to that activity. And I think we'd also maybe want to baseline that activity, find out which databases uh, get logged to on a regular basis, how much information is getting logged, and so on. And we can do that with DMVs. So here's how it works. We start with a session ID, and we can go off to a DMV called SysDMTran Session Transactions. This DMV has one row per session, which has a transaction that's currently active. And we can take a column out of that, a transaction ID, 
And you can take that down to another DMV, SysDMTran database transactions. And this database, per transaction, per database ID, has a row. So if you start a transaction, an explicit transaction, or, or even an implicit transaction, I suppose, uh, and you hit multiple databases along the way, you can uh, start a transaction and update tables in several different databases, if you like. Uh, this view will have one row per database in which any work was done. And so here we can see that my transaction actually wrote some rows in AdventureWorks. And you can see that there's a begin time populated there. Rows without a begin time, uh, that means that it was just a read-only transaction in that database. So I read some stuff from TempDB, and I wrote some stuff in AdventureWorks. And we can see the number of log records that were written, and we can see the number of bytes used. So if you have a situation where uh, some transaction has filled up your entire transaction log, which unfortunately is something we see all too often, uh, you can actually go into this DMV and you can ask which transactions have written to the transaction log. You can order by that number descending. Then you can take uh, the transaction IDs, go back to the SysDM trans session transactions table, find the sessions, go back to the sessions DMV, uh, find the requests associated with those, go take the SQL handle, pass it to the SysDM exec SQL text function, and find out which query caused this problem to occur. So you can see how all these DMVs work together very nicely. And if you're collecting all this data into uh, some kind of central baselining system, you can use this over time to track changes and figure out when problems started, if there are problems. So yet another component is the query processor. And this is the thing that's running all of your queries. Pretty complex component. And I'm going to sum it up in one slide. So you have your session. You want to make requests? Well, the query processor processes these requests uh, using components called tasks. And tasks are basically instructions for the query processor uh, to follow as it runs through things. Now, each request can have one or more task. When a, task, uh, when a request has multiple tasks, uh, we call that parallelism. Each task is bound to something called a worker. A worker is actually uh, an abstraction over a Windows operating system thread or fiber if you're running in fiber mode. Are you running in fiber mode, sir? No, OK. So he has Mars, but he doesn't get fiber mode. Very few people are running fiber mode anymore, but for completeness, have to include it. So the tasks are bound to workers, so they're going to be threads for probably all of you. And those threads, as they're running, are consuming CPU time or they're waiting. And waiting is what we want them not to do. So as threads are consuming CPU time, they're working, and they're getting your query closer to completion. As they're waiting, uh, they could be waiting for a lock, or waiting for the disk to finish uh, reading some data, or they could be waiting for some memory, and so on. Uh, as they're waiting, they're not working. They're not getting your query any closer to completion. So we want to be able to monitor and see how much CPU time is being incurred, and how long things are waiting. And we do that once again via DMVs. So the primary DMV we can use is sysdmos tasks. And this will have one row per session per thread or task that's running on behalf of that session. And each row has a task address. And this is another binary value that can be used to uh, talk to various other DMVs that deal with tasks. And there's information about, uh, there's a few real-time columns. There's a context switches count. So this is actually the sessions and request CMVs. The CPU time metric is not always updated in real time. As you look at it, if a big query is running, it might just be sitting there at zero the whole time. Uh, if you want to know kind of a better idea of how much CPU time is running, you can come over to the sysdmos tasks and check out the context switches. Now, context switches and CPU time aren't exactly a one-to-one -one relationship, but a high amount of switching is indicative of a high amount of CPU consumption. So you can come in here and at least get some kind of information about what's going on. Another useful column here is the pending I.O. byte count. Now, that's called pending. So it sounds like this is the number of currently outstanding I.O. requests. Uh, in actuality, it's just a badly named column. This is the cumulative number of physical I.O. requests that have been incurred on behalf of this task. So if you want to find out how many I.O. requests your entire uh, session has done, you can come in and just sum these columns by session ID. Uh, another useful thing in here is the worker address. And again, the worker is the abstraction over the operating system thread, and there's a DMV for that. So you can take this worker address, 
go over to the worker's DMV and get information at that level of granularity if you like. So again, when you're baselining, you want to keep track of how many tasks are spun up on behalf of each request, so what level of, uh, what degree of parallelism your requests are using. Uh, you want to keep track of how many context switches and how many IOs are being consumed on behalf of your tasks. And perhaps you want to keep track of uh, what kind of thread switching you're having, you're having over on the worker's side. But a much easier and very interesting thing to keep track of is weights. Why is your query slow? Well, probably because it's waiting on something. So you go to the sysdmos waiting tasks DMV. That also has a session ID column. And you can ask, what are the tasks associated with my session actually waiting on? Why aren't they consuming CPU time and doing work? Well, maybe they are consuming CPU time and doing work, in which case there won't be any rows for your request in this view. But if there are rows, that means that you're waiting on something. So here we can see that session 53 um, has a few CX packet weights. Uh, these are parallelism weights. So that means that threads within 53 are waiting for other threads. And what they're waiting on is this thread that's being blocked by session 54, and it's being blocked on a lock weight. So that means 54 has, a, in this case, a page lock on some database page that 53 needs to continue its work. And that's why it's not returning. It can't do anything until it gets that lock. So to make the query faster, we have to get rid of that lock somehow. Uh, so w as you're troubleshooting, finding the actual cause of the performance problem leads you naturally to the solution. And that's why we say that troubleshooting and actually finding the exact cause of the problem is by far the most important part of the performance tuning process. Um, these weight types, by the way, are somewhat documented in books online, but there are a lot of third-party websites uh, that tell you what all these mean. So what you do is you collect these things, and if you see one spiking or if you see one causing you problems, just go out, paste it into your favorite search engine, and invariably you get a ton of different web pages, forums, etc., that explain exactly what's going on. And these weights really do tell you why your query is slow. And they really do help you evaluate how to get it to the next level. So the final component I want to talk about uh, with regard to the dynamic management views is TempDB. And this thing is used everywhere. Uh, I have a little list of things there, and that's not even all-inclusive. Uh, TempDB is used more and more and more by every single SQL Server release. And in lots of cases, uh, I see situations where TempDB, the disk is churning away, uh, or maybe it's auto-growing and filling up the disk, or whatever. And the DBAs have trouble understanding what it is that's causing the problem. And again, this is where the guesswork starts. People start rebooting the server, uh, shutting down apps, killing SPIDs at random, trying to get things back under control. We don't need to guess. You can go out to the DMVs, and you can ask. Sys DMDB task space usage uh, will have one row per task. Again, that's per uh, query processor instruction that's associated with your request per session, and it'll tell you how much TempDB activity is being done on behalf of that task. Now, there's four columns that you need to look at. There's user objects and uh, internal objects. Both of them have allocation counts and deallocation counts. User objects are things like temp tables. Internal objects are things like sorts, spools, hashes. And so what you can do is add these up, the allocations and the deallocations. If you have a session with a high allocation count, and no deallocations, that means that it's consuming space in TempDB right now. And if you have a session with high allocation count and high, high deallocation count, it may not be consuming space right now, but it's been consuming and deallocating space perhaps quite rapidly over time. So again, this is yet another thing you can baseline. You can keep track how much TempDB space should I expect there to be consumed at any given time in my application. If I see it spike, I know that there's a problem and I know that there's something that I should uh, perhaps do about it. So is there anything I can clarify about DMVs at this point? Sir? Actually, I'd like to step to the microphone. That'd probably be better. Thank you. OK, the microphone doesn't work. <laughs> Take 
baseline to recall that information? Excellent question. So the question was, monitoring with DMVs, great. How often do I want to monitor? What kind of frequency do I want to use on my queries? And the answer is it depends on how in-depth you want to get. Uh, a lot of times, a uh, snapshot once every 15 minutes is fine to start with. Uh, once you start a, finding a problem area, then I'll start drilling in and taking more frequent snapshots. So if I'm, for example, taking a snapshot once every 15 minutes all day long, and I have some idea of what's going on, and I find that during a certain period, activity seems a lot higher, I'll schedule uh, my snapshot process to go in every five minutes during that period and try to drill down. Maybe once I find a five-minute period that's more active, I'll schedule it to go in once every 30 seconds for a while and just kind of drill into the lowest level of granularity I can, again, without impacting the rest of the server. Because, again, these things are fast. They return uh, data you know, fairly quickly, and they've been designed to not impact things. But every query you run has some impact. And the worst thing you can do when performance troubleshooting is cause more problems than you're trying to fix. Does that answer your question? Yes, sir. Right. So the question is, would I do that for all the DMVs that I'm running, uh, or just a few? And the answer is, uh, most of the time I would do it for all of them. The exception would be really big DMVs, like the LOX DMV that I mentioned earlier. If you run that thing every five minutes, uh, you risk causing a major problem. So uh, that would be an example of one. Let's put it this way. If the DMV, if you do select star from the DMV, and it takes more than a second or two to come back in SSMS, you probably want to be cautious with it. Uh, but most of these that I've just showed you, uh, they're very, very quick. They stay rather small, even on pretty active servers. Any, uh, anything else I can clarify for anyone? Yes, sir. Ah, so that's a complex question. Um, when I say snapshotting, am I storing the data off into tables? Am I using a third-party product? Uh, the answer is yes. There are third-party products that do a very good job of this. You can use, uh, again, your favorite search provider to find them. Uh, you can also use, there's a product built into SQL Server 2008 called the MDW, Management Data Warehouse. And that uh, is a tool that you can use to do some of these snapshots. Not, unfortunately, it doesn't hit all the DMVs, but you can configure it uh, to do a lot more than it does by default. Uh, there's also a tool that I've written that I'll show you a little later called Who is Active. It's a store procedure, and it helps you pull data out of the DMVs and put it into a table within a database, like a DBA database or something like that. If you, a lot of uh, shops will have a DBA database on each instance where you can do data collection, store DBA store procedures, things like that. So oftentimes, I'll just collect into one of those tables in the database, put a timestamp on the table, and then I can go look back whenever I need to at the data. Does that uh, clarify things? Great. We'll take uh, one more, if there is one. All right, with that, I'll pass uh, over to Mike. All right, this brings us to the audience participation segment. I'm going to ask each of you to come up and relate your story about ext No, I'm not going to do that. Um, but I am going to ask everybody, by a show of hands, how many in the room have heard of extended events before? All right, that's actually better than I usually do. Now, of the people who have heard of it, how many of you have actually tried to start an event session? And yeah, the number gets a little bit smaller. And I'll, I'll even dare asking it, how many people actually use extended events on a regular basis to troubleshoot problems? OK, it's nice to have two or three people. That helps me know what it is that I need to talk about here. One of the main questions that we get asked is, why the heck did you do extended events? What was wrong with SQL Trace? We like SQL Trace. We are comfortable with Circle Trace. Why did you do something new? Um, and it's a complex answer, but I'll try to simplify it for you. We have, we have different systems today than we had when we invented SQL Trace and SQL Profiler quite a while ago. Systems are much more complex, whether it's a multi-node system or just a scale-up system that has 256 processors or more, or encompasses several different parts of SQL Server, like analysis services plus the database engines. This is just a much more complex problem space to solve. And SQL Trace just wasn't quite there yet. 
People are also much more sensitive to the impact of a diagnostic workload on your actual workload. So it doesn't really do you much good if you see that you have some type of problem, you start up the diagnostic tool and your server falls over. Or it slows down so much that you're not actually doing what you're trying to trace. There have been some problems on bigger systems with SQL Trace. We needed to move beyond that. We needed to get a diagnostic system that addressed those performance impact problems. We also want to get more detailed information. So how do we go drill in even farther, get closer to the metal on these servers and systems, and, and find out you know, the real core of what's going on? And then finally, with these complex systems, we have unexpected interactions, and we wanted to be able to see those interactions. X events tries to, OK, I'm going to say that occasionally. X events, it's our code name for it. Extended events is the official name. If I slip back and forth, you'll know what's going on. We have a couple specific value props in extended events. Um, and it turned out it was easiest and best to achieve these value props by creating a, a new parallel system rather than trying to implement all of this in SQL Trace for a number of reasons. And so we end up with extended events. Uh, scalability and performance is a big deal. As you get to these larger systems, being able to scale your diagnostic system is very important. So we like to say with extended events, as you get a bigger machine, you're doing more work, you have more events, and it's OK. We're not going to change our performance impact significantly. The other thing we wanted to do to get this more data idea is each event that you'll see in extended events is dynamic. You can collect additional data and just attach it on to every event that you want to do. You can even perform actions, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. We have the capability of doing cross-process tracking. So certainly now implemented within the database engine, if you have, say, a query that goes parallel, we can track those parallel threads and see this parent-child relationship. And finally, if you're tracing other systems, like say you're doing a kernel trace in Windows or you're using one of the other products out there that has implemented um, ETW or event tracing for Windows, one of the ways that we export data in extended events is to the ETL format. So that gives you the ability to take the tracing you're doing in SQL Server, load that up in whatever your favorite ETW analysis tool is and see it right next to your kernel trace or the trace from whatever app you have that implements ETW. So we're trying to be flexible there and allow you to use the tools that you like. We introduced extended events in SQL 2008, and we didn't really do anything with it in R2 because that was an incremental release for the product. But Denali represents essentially the V2 for extended events, and we've added significant capabilities to the product. First of all, number one request every time we went out and talked was user interface. I looked at your DDL, meh, a little too hard. We did it, we heard you, we have a user interface, and we're going to take a look at it. The second part was in this idea of moving our tracing infrastructure forward, we needed to have parity with SQL Trace. So in 2008, we had a lot of events, but you couldn't get the same data that you could get from SQL Trace. We made sure that we added a bunch of events, we extended some of the events so that we have data parity with SQL Trace. If you can get the data in SQL Trace, in Denali, you can also get it in extended events. We introduced a managed API. So if you're a tool builder or a developer who wants to leverage this, you get the same capabilities accessed pro pro programmatically that we use in our UI. So if you want to write your own tools, you can do it. We don't hide anything from you. It's all there in our API. And finally, just a couple of cleanup things. For those of you who have worked with extended events a little bit, we had this two-file thing going on where we had the data in one file, the metadata in another file. We got rid of that metadata file. It's all one file. You don't have to pair them together. That was kind of a pain. And then towards handling these complex systems, you're going to start in Denali to see more systems picking up extended events as a tracing infrastructure. Um, analysis services is there. Replication has added some stuff. Uh, Parallel Data Warehouse has added some stuff. This is their V1, so they haven't gone as far with the UI, but you're starting to get the same format of traces so that as you get those out, you can start comparing them together, and it's all in a common format. Just so really quickly about our architecture. We have this notion of packages that you may have heard of in extended events. This is really just a unit of organization. In Denali, we removed most of the need to know what package things come in, but you will see it, so if you start exploring the system, you see package, just notice that's how we organize some of our objects into groups. Uh, products like the SQL Server Database Engine have multiple packages in it, but for Denali, those don't matter as much. What matter more are the specific objects, and we're going to talk about four of them that really matter to you. The event, you can imagine, is a key object in extended events. This represents a specific action somewhere in our source code, so it's a, a point of execution. When we go past that point of execution, we fire an event. 
A difference you'll see from SQL Trace is that each of the events has a very specific schema. So if you're familiar with SQL Trace, you know they have about 46 columns. They're the same name for every event. Sometimes the column contains what the event says. Sometimes it contains something else. Sometimes the column is named integer data one. You won't see that in extended events. Every event has its own unique schema. If you see a column that says broker endpoint address, it will actually contain a broker endpoint address. So I think that makes it a little bit easier to understand. Actions is what we use to extend a specific event. So an action will represent us doing something, hence the name action. Uh, most commonly, it's going out and getting a piece of global information, like say a session ID or SPID, a database name. This is a piece of global information that we can pull out of the server. You can attach that to any event if you want that information as part of the event. A uh, second thing that actions can do is actually go out and do what you might think of as an action, like take a memory dump, which is a very key thing for tracing because you want to be able to trigger a dump at a very specific point. You can do that with extended events. You say, when this event fires under these very specific conditions, dump this thread. And that allows you to get very detailed about how you look at your memory dumps. Targets is just the name we call the things where we put our data. There's multiple targets available in the extended events system. Some of them are synchronous. Some of them are asynchronous. Most of them are asynchronous because that's how we address the performance issue. And we'll look at a few of them as we go on to demos a bit later. And then finally, and this is really cool, um, our predicate system is just a runtime filter. So we support all of the typical filtering that you would like, both on the data that's right in the event, as well as a lot of the data that's attainable through actions. You can do all the things you expect as far as Boolean expressions, looking at the logical data, and even looking at state of things. Like I could do, I want this when the duration is the maximum duration for this particular query, and I only want to ca capture that event every time it gets bigger. Um, it gives you a lot of capabilities to both reduce the amount of, uh, the impact of your performance, because we'll fire fewer events if you're filtering that at runtime, and it also reduces the amount of data you collect to just what you're looking at. Essentially what we do is when we fire an event, the first thing we do is we evaluate this predicate, if the, if the current conditions don't meet that predicate, we short circuit the event and stop firing. So you save the time to go gather all the extra data, fire all the extra actions, or you know, even publish the event. The event session is really the thing that you're running. So this, in SQL trace, you create the trace. Well, the trace is the event session in extended events. You can see from the picture, the event session is a top level thing. You can put multiple targets on a session. So if you want to write to more than one target, no problems. You can put multiple events on it. And you can actually put the single event in many event sessions. So you can have a bunch of event sessions if you want to collect SQL statement completed in all of them. No problem. You add it to all of them. We're only going to fire the event once. And then you add actions and predicates to each of those events. I'd mentioned the idea that packages is an organizational component, but it is not a boundary. You can mix events and targets and predicates from multiple different packages as long as they're within the same product. And that's no problem. And then just as you see, some of the things we set, buffering is how we handle this asynchronous thing. So we publish everything to a buffer before we publish it to a target. That's how we improve our performance on a system where you want a lower impact, but how that asynchronous publishing works as far as how much time it takes you to get the data somewhere where you can see it. We call that latency. That's actually tunable in almost every target through both size and time, depending on the target. And the final thing I want to look at in the slides before I go to a demo is how do we do this notion of tracking events that are correlated together? So event A causes event B type of thing. So we start out with a tracked activity, like I've run a query or I've run a stored procedure. What happens inside SQL Server is we actually start up a thread, and we're going to fire some events on that thread. If you've turned on what we call correlation, we actually give every event an ID. And that ID is represented here with the letter A for activity ID. The activity ID is a GUID plus a sequence number. And in here, the GUID is 1. It's a very simple GUID. And you can see I fired two events. So I have event 1.1 and event 1.2. But we get to this second event on process 1. It goes, hey. I need to do some more work somewhere else. Maybe it's a parallel query, so it's kicking some work off to some other threads. And what happens is we start that other thread up. It gets a new GUID, 2, and it fires its first event, 1. So 2.1, that's the activity. But you can see what we've done here is we've transferred the activity ID of the parent, 1.2, and we've filled that in. So when this event 2.1 fires, it will also have a parent activity ID 
that tracks where it came from. And then the process goes on and more events fire on each of these threads and they have their activity IDs. But this allows us to set up this relationship where you can see, oh, here's my parent activity, here's a child event that started from that parent activity, and then here's all the other threads that happened on, all the other events that happened on that secondary thread. And you can run queries that draw those together. So that's going to take us into some use cases. Switch over. Quick question here. It would be two. So the question, so let me repeat the question. The question was, if process two that you saw there kicked off process three, what would the parent of process three be? And it would, in fact, be process two. Essentially, this just creates a stair-step approach that can go on for as long as this correlative relationship goes on. Anything else before I jump into the demo? All right. So for those of you who have been working with extended events a little bit, We'll just do a refresher. This is the 2008 experience for extended events. So you have some DDL that's available to create your event sessions. Now I, I stand by my assertion that this DDL is much simpler than the spec procs you had to use for SQL Trace, but a few people still thought that this was just too much typing to do to set up an event session. And then, of course, when you wanted to go and analyze the event session, you had to go down and you had to write some X path to pull the data out of a big XML blog, so you'd write a bunch of queries like this. And if you're not a big fan about writing X path to look at your trace data, you may feel free to boo now. Yeah. All right. We've uh, tried to go beyond the X path situation here. So we'll start out here in Object Explorer and Management Studio. Our UI experience is all in Management Studio. Right underneath the Management node, the first thing you'll see in Object Explorer is that we have an, a, a brand new spanking extended events node. Under that, we have a list of sessions. As you can see, here I have my system health session, which is the session that runs on every server starting with 2008. This is somewhat equivalent to the default trace that you might be used to from SQL trace, in this case, it's all about, you know, looking at very impactful problems in the system. How you get to the new builder is you right-click on sessions. We have both a wizard experience and just a standard dialogue experience. I'm going to go into the dialogue experience. And you come up with this guy. We'll zoom in a little bit. First thing we want to do is give it a name. And then we'll scroll over here, and I guess we'll get rid of that. I guess I'll have to use this. So one of the things we wanted to preserve from SQL Profiler is this notion of templates. Um, we made the experience a little bit better in addition to the templates that you have. With the system, you can actually save your own templates, as you see under user templates. I have a whole bunch, including TechEd demo. That sounds like an interesting session to use here at TechEd. In addition, on the main page here, we have a couple scheduling options in terms of I want to start this every time the server starts. I want to start it right now after I finish this. I want to watch live data that we'll look at, and I want to do correlation tracking. And I'm just going to go ahead and click Events, the next page. This is where we do all the cool stuff. I actually used a template, so this is all pre-configured, but I'm going to show a few things about the UI so you can see it. First thing we have is our event library. There is a lot of events in SQL Server. In Denali, we're going to have around 500 plus, so we want to be able to make it a little bit easier for you to find it. I can just type in the part of a name, and it's going to do this auto-resolve, so that's a very nice way to find events quickly. You can type in anything you want. I can actually go and filter by category, so all of our events have sets of categories, so if I want to see just the execution, I could just check execution, and I'd see only execution-related things. And then we also have this ability to search in different things. So I was searching by event name, I can also search in the descriptions or just the fields. All that's available as part of the search experience. You can see when you select event down on the bottom, you're going to get a description of the event along with the fields and a description of the fields. And if I want to do a particular event, like say I want the user event, 
I can just double click it. It's going to pop over here into the selected events list. I can also multi select these, do a discontiguous select and hit the arrow. All that works. As I said, you can actually modify each event. You can add a predicate or you can add actions to any given event. So you do that by clicking this configure thing. At this point, I could actually move on. We could run this. I'd be collecting these events, but sometimes you want a little bit more data. You can see in this pre configured version, I have some indicators here. This lightning bolt is my global field, which means if I select on this, I'm going to have some of these selected. And I'll just click up here to sort this. You can see that I have client app name, database name, event sequence, and session ID. These are just global data that I'm adding to every one of these events. This happens to each be the same, but they don't have to be. I could add the call stack to SQL statement completed. It's only being added to SQL statement completed. Same is true for the filter or the predicate. I've actually added a predicate to all of my events saying that I only want to fire that event if it happens in the Northwind database. And I've added an additional criteria for just this one event, so these are all independent. And then the last thing you can see here is this is more just an informational piece for the most part. It shows you once again the fields that are part of an event plus the、uh, information about that event. There is one thing here. When you pick an event like SQL statement completed that has an optional field statement here, I can check that or uncheck that if I want to collect the statement. In some cases, we make this a default option if it's something you would obviously want but maybe don't want. In other cases, we don't collect stuff by default. Data storage is where you select your target. You can put multiple targets. So you can see here I have two targets a file target and a histogram target, which is basically count stuff by a category. When you add a target, it's going to give you a set of options.、I'll、zoom in a little for you here that are unique to that target. So, file target, I want to pick a, a place where I'm going to put the file. I want to set my file size and tell whether I'm going to allow rollover files. I pick the histogram. You can see I'm going to do, build a histogram on the weight type for the weight info event. If I wanted to add another, I could just go down here and pick the ETW Classic Sync target. I could set the information I want for that. I don't actually want that target, so I'm just going to remove it. And then finally, in the advanced options section, we just set the session options. So, how we handle event loss, how many seconds we want to wait for latency. I just use five because that's good for demos. It's probably not the best for production systems, so you'd want to play with that. And we can set some memory size and how we do partitioning. I'm not going to go into a lot of details there because that would take a little bit more time than we have. I click OK, it goes away, and what I see over here is in my Object Explorer, I have the Tech Ed session. First thing I'm going to do is going to right click. I'm going to go ahead and say Start Session. I'm going to say Watch Live Data. So, what we have here is this is actually hooked up to the session and it's looking for whatever happens in that session. I'm going to start a little workload here. This is just selecting some random data out of Northwind, maybe. It's not connected. Now it's going to select some random data out of Northwind. Make sure it's going to run for a while. Yes. Execute. So that's doing some stuff. And as you see, we're starting to get events pop into the system over here. So this is actually a near live stream of data that's coming out of the session that you just saw me create, telling me when a SQL statement's starting. and When wait infos are happening, I have a little delay in here, so every once in a while it's going to pop some more events. You can see we have 72 events up here, and that's going to increment over time. Now, it's not really that useful to tell me that you have a name of an event and the time that it happened. So, there's a couple different ways you can look at that data. One is you can look down here at the details pane. When I pick a specific event, I can see some information about the activity ID that we talked about, the client app name. If I scroll down here, I can see the statement. If that happened to be a long statement, I can double click here. It's going to give me the statement in a dialog. But that's still not quite what I'm looking for. I'd really like to see more data up here in the grid. So, one way I can do that is I can actually right click here and I can just add that statement field right up there to the grid. Another way I can do it is we have our own toolbar available. And I go to choose columns and I can see that I have a very standard set of two list box t h i n g I can go and grab advanced sequence and add that over there. We put the offset in, click OK, and that's actually added that information right up to the grid. 
And the last thing I can do is once I have a view that I'm interested in, I can save that just by going save as view here. I've saved one previously and I'm just going to open that. And what that actually gives me is it, it gives me a whole set of columns that I've already saved. So if I have a view in the grid that I really like, I like those columns, I like the filter, whatever I've put up there, I can just save that as a display setting. I'm just going to get rid of the display pane here. Now the last thing I want to talk about this display grid is there's a few advanced options. I'm going to go in here and just stop the collection of this thing right now so I can just essentially pause that here. And I can do some things. Like say I'm interested in saying what was the highest duration that I had here. I can just go there, right click on duration and say sort. Apparently nothing had any, oh, okay. Sort by duration. And I can see I've actually gotten a sort of the duration here. We can do filtering, so let's say I want to, okay. Actually, we'll do grouping first. So I want to group stuff. Grouping is another way, you know, just the duration, eh, you know, okay, I got a big list of duration, but there's a bunch of different queries going on here in SQL statement. Maybe I want to group by that and see what the longest running statement was. So I'm going to go in here and say group. I'm going to group by this SQL statement. Click OK, and you can see that I've grouped this. And then I can actually aggregate that if I want. Duration is interesting to me, so I want to do a sum of all of my aggregations, or of all of my duration, and I want to sort by that in a descending order. And I can see here that my declare at report int select report statement is actually the longest one. And then I can go under and I can see all of the events that are part of that. Expand that a little bit. That actually shows me the duration of that. And then I can go through in here and actually look at, you know, what are the interesting events to look at. So it allows me to kind of drill in more quickly from my entire event set. Remove that. And then finally, I can do some filtering. So if I want to filter very quickly, say I'm really only interested in cases, let's find something a little more interesting. You know, I'm interested in this wait for delay. I can actually right click here, I can say filter by this value, and it's going to pull up our filter UI. Take a closer look at that. We can do a couple things in here. I can set a time-based filter, so I can just check that. I have this little scrolly behavior here, or I can just set the date and time directly. I have a criteria setter that you'd expect here. Since I said filter by that value, it set it up as SQL statement equals this. I can pick from a whole list of different operators here. I can go in, I can find all of the information that's available from this particular data set, both logical data and the action data that we pulled. I want to do session ID, I can set where session ID equals, you notice it put up a little red X there, so it realizes that session ID that wait for a delay 10 seconds isn't going to work. But I could put in a session ID of 52. So you have very flexible filtering, we handle both the runtime filtering and the post runtime filtering. So you can handle both. That is really the whirlwind tour of the UI. So any questions, clarifications about what you've seen about the UI? We'll take the first question here in the front. No, you cannot. Well, let me, uh, let me reiterate that. So the question was, can I run this against 2008 R2? The create experience that I showed, you cannot run directly against 2008 R2. But you can script out the session that you created, and as long as you haven't used any features that aren't available in R2, you can take that script and run it back. So if you have both, you can at least transfer the scripts back and forth. This UI that we've seen here, the live viewer that I showed will not work against 2008, but the file, this also works exactly the same for opening up a file. It would look exactly identical. Everything I showed you will work against the file. We do support the file formats all the way back to what we introduced in 2008 and 2008 R2, so those will both work for you. There was a question a couple seats back. Consumed by the data, okay, so the question was, is there a way for this to be consumed by the database tuning advisor? And the answer is, no, there isn't, not in Denali. I'm working with the DTA team to 
take on our XEL file as the new thing we use, which is obviously one of the steps we have to get to, um, it's not doable right now. Anything else other than that? I think uh, we'll bring Adam back up for some DMV stuff. All right. So Mike has just showed you some of the extended events. Well, I think you went to sleep. And my computer's asleep. Wonderful. So while I'm rebooting my computer, we'll talk about DMVs. <laughs> PowerPoint. So Mike has just talked about some of the extended events uh, stuff. And extended events is really useful when you want to go out and get a very granular view of what's going on in the system. So for example, one of the events um, Mike captured was the weight info event. And you can go in and see every single weight as it occurred. One of the DMVs that I mentioned before was SysDMOS uh, weighting tasks. And that shows you the weights that are currently occurring on your system. So what you can do is with extended events, you can go out and find all of the weights that have occurred over time, but it won't give you quite as much information about each weight as the weighting tasks DMV will give you. So what we can do is use these two tools together. So for example, if we find that we have a number of weights of a specific type from extended events, uh, for example, latch weights, uh, where there is a lot more information available on the latch weight than just a latch weight occurred, uh, we can take that information from extended events and then we can go back and drill in using the DMVs. And that is what I'm going to show you today. I'm going to show you an example of, uh, if you'll give me one second. I'm going to give you an example of a memory situation. This is a program I've written called SQL Query Stress. And it's just going to take uh, whatever query I give it. And this query is uh, select top 10,000 uh, a dot star from master dot SPT values as A and master SPT values as B. I'm just cross joining those two tables. And that's just uh, a system table that's sitting in master that I like to use for demos like these. And I'm just ordering by a couple of the columns. Now this table is not indexed. So there's going to be a major sort in there. And whenever sorts run, uh, they consume memory. You need memory for the sort. And so what I'm going to do is run this query 100 times on eight threads. So when I kick this off, eight sessions will be opened on my SQL Server instance, running this query until it completes. And each one will run it 100 times. Actually, we won't let it run that many times, but that is what could happen. And let me just open this SQL file and connect up. And so what we're going to see, I'm going to kick this off. I just hit go. And what we'll see right away is weights in the waiting tasks view. And I know that I'm going to see resource semaphore because I wrote this demo. Uh, but if you saw resource semaphore in your view, you would say, what is this resource semaphore thing? And what would you do with that? Well, you would take this and you would copy this and you would paste it into your favorite search engine. And it would bring up a web page that would hopefully tell you that resource semaphore is a query memory weight. And query memory is the type of memory that's used when there are sorts or hashes. And uh, sorts and hashes take space to do their work. And so that space goes in, uh, into an area called the resource semaphore. So as you can see, all of our queries are waiting quite a long time on this resource semaphore wait. Uh, they've been waiting you know, five seconds here. And I can pull this information another way. I've written a store procedure called who is active. And I'm going to run it. And who is active takes information from all of the DMVs I've showed you today, plus a lot more. And it pulls back all the information into a single format. So it tells me this is how long these queries have been running. These are the session IDs for the queries. This is the actual text that the query is running. I bring it back into an XML format. So you can click on it and actually see the query as it was originally formatted. Um, get the login name. And then we have the wait info. And this is, again, this shows us what the query is actually waiting on. So we can see that this session was waiting four seconds for memory. And this session was waiting two seconds for memory. These weren't doing any work. They were just waiting for memory. Uh, we want them doing work and actually nearing completion, not sitting there waiting for memory. So we have to tune this. So I'm going to go ahead and stop this. And uh, let's grab one of these queries. 
Oops. Okay, so here's our query. And let's take a look at the query plan. And what we can see is that we have a sort here. And this sort is what's going to consume the memory. And the way that the query optimizer uh, works with sorts is that it uses the estimate, the estimated number of rows and the estimated row size uh, when the query was compiled to figure out how much space to allocate for the sort. So here, if we hover over here, this, we can see that our estimated number of rows is 6.2 million uh, with an estimated data size of 431 megs. And what that's going to mean is actually double that amount will be the ideal sort space. So we're going to have an ideal sort size of 860 megs, which very, very quickly consumes all the RAM on my laptop here, which is why we saw those resource semaphore weights. So if we want to drop that amount of memory allocation, we need to change something. Well, there's many ways you could do that. You could add an index. You could uh, put more memory into your server, or you can trick the query optimizer, and that's what we'll do here. So I'm going to change this query. And instead of uh, directly from master dot dot spt values, I'm going to do select top at i star from master spt values. And I'm going to copy that, paste it down here. And so now I'm selecting top at i rows from the table. What is at i? Well, it's a variable I haven't declared yet. And I'm going to set it to 2. Is that 2 billion? That's only 200 million. I need one more zero. So now I'm going to select the top 2 billion rows from each table. Now I know there's fewer than 2 billion rows. So that's definitely going to give me all the rows in each table. So this query is logically identical to the query we saw before. And it'll actually compile to pretty much the same plan as we got before. But what we can do is exploit the optimized for hint that was added uh, in, I believe, SQL Server 2008. And it's option optimize for. And we can optimize. We can tell the query optimizer to treat the query as though the value of add i was whatever we want. And so in this case, I'll make it 1,000. So we're going to optimize the query as though only 1,000 rows were coming out of each of those tables, even though it's many more than that in reality. And if we look at this query plan, we still have our sort, but now the estimate is only a million rows rather than 6 million rows. So when this sort runs, it's going to use one-sixth as much memory as the prior sorts. So let me go ahead and take this, paste it back into SQL Query Stress, Open my load file here. And I'm going to go ahead and hit go. And those have started running. And I can go back here and uh, run who is active again. And what we're going to see is uh, our resource semaphore is going to be gone. This is taking quite a while because now we no longer have a memory issue. We've removed the memory bottleneck. And guess what? We've created a new bottleneck. That's how query tuning works. Uh, you eliminate each bottleneck, and you get another bottleneck. You eliminate that bottleneck, you get another bottleneck. Along the way, things get faster and better. But uh, I'll cancel this, and we'll look at our new bottleneck. Uh, these are page latches. So what's a page latch up? Well, you take it, you copy the text, you paste it into your favorite search engine. And what you'll find out is that a page latch is a special type of synchronization primitive used for pages in the buffer pool. And in the buffer pool, uh, there's various types of pages. And each database file has a few key pages that determine where data can be written. And it has uh, GAM pages, global allocation map, SGAMs, shared global allocation maps, PFS pages, page free space pages. And what happens is every time something needs to be written out to the data file, uh, the first thing that's done is these pages are checked to see where stuff can be written. And the problem here is that uh, I have all of these sessions. And when I reduced that memory grant, I actually forced data, rather than being sorted in memory, to spill out to TempDB. So now uh, the queries don't have to wait for data, but they still need to do the sort. 
And so they put the data in tempdb, which means they have to write to tempdb. And so now we have eight sessions all trying to write into tempdb, and they're all asking uh, these special pages, where can I write the data? Where can I write the data? And each time that's done, uh, synchronization is used so that uh, as one request asks, where can I write the data, some other request doesn't come in and write the data in that space. So you know, we want to keep them separate. Now, this is done on a file by file basis. And so you would Google this, hopefully, or Bing it. Sorry, I'm at the Microsoft conference. And uh, you'd find out that that's the cause of this wait. And you take that information. And let me just kill this while it's running. My computer is obviously not doing too well today. Um, there we go. So you take this information, and you find out that the core uh, fix here is simply to create more tempdb files. So I'm going to go over here. Uh, we'll go into tempdb. We'll see that we actually only have one data file, so forcing all the activity onto that single file. And instead, I'll come over and create five files. So that'll run for a moment. And a good question to ask yourself right now is how many files should I create? And the answer is start with approximately half the number of schedulers on your system. So that means the number of cores. If you have hyper-threading, uh, oh, it's the number of cores divided by two, unless you have hyper-threading turned on, in which case it's the number of cores. Start with that many. If you don't have this kind of page latch contention, increase it a little bit more until, you, until it all goes away. And it's just kind of uh, something that you need to feel your way through a little bit. You don't want to create too many of these, because then there's some uh, other overhead that you can incur. So if you create like 10 times more tempdb files than you have uh, schedulers, you create a whole new type of contention. So again, this is part of the balance and the iter iterative nature of uh, performance tuning. So anyway, uh, we've now created all these tempdb files. And we're going to go back, jump into SQL Query Stress, load the settings file, paste the better version of the query that doesn't require memory back in, and hit go. Come back here, run who is active, and that'll run for a second, after which we'll find out if we relieve things, and we did. Now we have no waits. The queries are just running, consuming CPU time, and uh, they're going to return faster as a result. So if you came over and looked at my computer, you'd see I still have massive uh, disk problem. The, the light is actually solid. The tempdb drive is going crazy. But at this point, uh, on this hardware, there's nothing else I can do. So the next step from here, if I run who is active again, we'll probably see a wait called IO completion. And uh, that's just a pure disk wait. Again, you would take that wait. There it is. So I am still seeing some contention, but it's just pure disk contention at this point. So the next step from here is upgrade the hardware. So I can't show you that in real time, unfortunately. But anyway, just wanted to kind of walk you through how these things are actually useful uh, for real performance tuning. Uh, this tool, who is active, is a free store procedure I wrote. It'll be with the downloads. So you can go grab it. And this is what I use pretty much all day, every day, to do uh, most of my baselining and performance tuning. Uh, straight out of the box. Uh, it gives you information about the transactions, all the sessions that are running, the queries. You can get query plans. You can get tempdb information, and so on and so forth. So I think with that, we are about finished. Um, yes, sir. Sorry. Uh, the question was, where's the download information? It's at sqlblog.com. And uh, if you have any questions after this, uh, we'll be around. Um, I'm also going to be at the Database Technical Learning Center area uh, tomorrow at 10.30 for a couple of hours and the next day for a couple of hours. So feel free to come by. I'd love to chat. Um, yeah, I'll also be there to, uh, both Wednesday and Thursday in the DBI section of the Microsoft Technical Learning Center at 10.30 both days. So if you have more questions, definitely come down. Uh, also, the UI that I showed here will be available in the next CTP of Denali. And if you want to be informed of when that comes out, Come to the DBI section of our learning center, and you can get your badge scanned, and you'll get email when the next CTP is available. Right. So I hope we've uh, showed you that uh, performance tuning is all about finding the problem, and that SQL Server, at this point, definitely has the tools to help you get there. 
And using a little uh, legwork after that, it's very easy to actually fix the problem. Why don't you come up and talk to us in one second, because that's a little more involved. Uh, I just want to thank you all for coming. We're now exactly out of time.